Hello, everybody, and thank you for attending our webinar. I'll go ahead and jump right into it. I hope to uh, leave a little time for questions. We'll see how it goes. Um, but feel free to submit your questions via the, um, via the chat. All right, so here's the agenda for today. So why does LTE still matter? Of course, I think most people realize that it, it does, of course, but I'll go over just a little bit of data for that. And then we'll talk a little bit about how UE processes or goes through a connection to the network, and then spend some time in the LTE signal format when you talk about measurements or what you're trying to measure or troubleshoot understanding some basic things about the LTE signal format is very helpful. And then I'll talk about um, some of the general purpose power measurements that are still available. Power is still king, I think, in many ways. And so I'll spend a little bit of time on that and then jump into some LTE signal analyzer tests and uh, maybe some techniques and how to potentially use them. So why LTE still matters? Well, if you look at some of the data that's out there, and this is from, I think, the Ericsson Mobility Report, where it talks about subscribers, current LTE subscribers, and future subscribers. Um, what you find is is pretty amazing. It was amazing to me. I, I kind of thought, well, many people will jump over more quickly, but according to according to this particular data set, it looks like LTE revenue. Um, is gonna be very significant for a very long time. So as you can see, it really is out beyond 2025 uh, before um, 5G and R starts to overtake LTE. And the other thing I think too, is that LTE still requires significant changes to core networks. And that's a huge undertaking, you know, to, to completely replace a core network. And so um, bottom line is it's here for a while. Uh, another issue is, or another feature of LTE 5G and R is that it can operate in conjunction with 4G LTE. And so that's um, referred to as non-standalone. And so for the time being, many of the networks that are out there, in fact, most uh, in many countries, perhaps all, uh, LTE it really acts as the control plane. So if you're really trying to hype 5G and R are trying to really utilize it to a significant advantage. Uh, LTE is critically important because you can't really even attach to a 5G network unless you, you have a good LTE um, 4G signal. So really the, the full promise of 5G is gonna require a new core, new radios, uh, adoption of new end user devices, which you know I bought a device about a year ago and I think it was nearly $1,000. Um, not gonna replace it anytime soon. So it's gonna take time to get all that stuff in place. So LTE's here to stay for a while at least. So uh, the UE process of connecting, and uh, you know, I guess this, this sort of illustrates which channels, physical, logical channels, what, you know, what things are important when you go to troubleshoot a network. And so I'll go briefly through that process. So mobile power is on, it begins to search for carriers and it's essentially doing a, a search through frequencies. Um, and once it finds a carrier, it starts to decode the primary sync signal, then it decodes the secondary sync. And then from that, it calculates the PCI and detects reference signals that are um, coming from that carrier. And then it can read the broadcast channel. So once it reads that broadcast channel, it gets all the information it really needs to start the connection. So it's really a long process just to, well, it doesn't take very long, but there's many steps in the process to really get to the point of connecting. So um, you gotta have those those channels in place, primary sync, secondary sync, reference channels, um, uh, you know, the broadcast channel, all of those need to be in place for the system really to, or for the phone really to connect. And um, there's also critical information in there in terms of 
you know, which sector am I talking to? How is that frame synchronized so I can get proper timing? And then in that signal two or reference signals that really provide constant power for setting correct power levels. And those reference signals also have known data to the mobile. So the no mobile knows what to expect from those reference signals. And that allows it to do some compensation for noise or interference or distortion. So all those channels are, are really critically important. So now I'll, I'll take a little bit of time to talk about the format, the physical format of, the, of an LTE um, downlink so that it kind of frames what the measurements are doing when we talk about those later. So the first part of that is, and, and many of you have been around, that have been around for a long time probably already know some of this, um, but if you're new to LTE, I think it'll be helpful in understanding those, those measurements. So an LTE signal is really made up of a whole bunch of smaller signals, and those signals are called resource elements. And they're really single subcarriers. And those individual subcarriers then comprise the whole carrier. So if you think of it as, um, you know, one little tiny spike, or, you know, it's really like a bed of nails that get transmitted. Uh, and those subcarriers are 15 kilohertz apart, and they make up the carrier bandwidth, which is variable. So if you look at this table down here, you can see that there's various bandwidths that can be assigned to a particular carrier. And so that means different numbers of subcarriers or reference elements, as they're called technically in the in the standard. And so you can see as the as the channel bandwidth widens, we get we get a lot more of these reference elements. And I also show in here the carrier bandwidth and the guard band. Um, so each time a carrier is implemented, there's a little bit of space at each edge that help it keep all of its power inside that particular channel. So the channel is a little bit wider than the carrier actually is. All right, and then also briefly here, I mentioned the number of resource blocks, and I'll talk more about resource blocks here later, but basically, if you take chunks or a certain number of these subcarriers and carve them up, um, you will get a what's called a resource block. And so I'll talk more about that. Here's a couple pictures of just some carriers that have, you know, I'm looking at just from a spectrum perspective. The one on the left is a five megahertz carrier. And uh, it's interesting, you can kind of see here, there's, there's something going on here with these dips that show up in this area right here. And also right here, we'll talk more about that in just a second. And this carrier is a little bit lightly loaded. It's, you know, you can see that there's, a um, this is a power density display. So the uh, brighter the color means that there's more power. So in other words, the this carrier is spending more time idling. And if you compare that to the carrier to the right, which is a 10 megahertz carrier, it's powered up you know, and it's sort of average power is up here much higher. So this is a, a heavily loaded carrier that's that's transmitting most of the time. That little that little area that is kind of different in this five megahertz carrier on the left. I'll, I'll zoom in here on this other carrier, and so I you know adjusted the settings to really zoom in and see what's going on in there. Now inside this larger carrier, I can see all these little spikes. Well, those are reference elements, and those reference elements are also associated with a little bit more power. You can see this hump that's right here, and it turns out those are the, some of the synchronization channels, and so primary and secondary sync show up in this display when I really you know, um, zoom in on it. And so we'll spend more time talking about what's going on in here as we go along. Okay, so that was all frequency discussion. So if I go back to slides, right, this is a discussion of frequency. So we're talking about carriers in a frequency bandwidth. 
Here we're looking at frequency. And then finally here, we're talking now about time, what happens in time. So uh, LTE is a framed system. So there's framing and, you know, or chunks. And each frame is 10 milliseconds in length. And those frames that are constantly spewed out of a radio are broken up into one millisecond chunks and those are called subframes so you have a subframe that's um, that builds up to a frame and then within a subframe you also have slots and there's two slots in a single subframe and then each slot contains seven symbols so if you're really not a digital person um, a symbol may not mean that much to you, but basically a symbol is a chunk of data. It could be, um, you know, two bits of data. It could be four bits. It could be, you know, more. It depends on the depth of the modulation, um, you know, to determine, you know, what can be put in that time space. So a higher order modulation, if we have really good signal, you can get more symbols in that same time space that you could, than you could with a lower order modulation, maybe if there's more noise or if it's a critical channel that uses a lower order modulation. But at any rate, so so each each uh, slot contains seven symbols in time. So that is referred to in LTE as a resource block, and those resource blocks are seven symbols in length in time and then if you look at them from frequency it's actually bundled together with 12 of these subcarriers or reference elements so if you were to look at that graphically what you would get is in frequency 12 different reference elements and then seven different or seven symbols in time in length and that's what's referred to as a resource block. And so you see in, in LTE resource blocks referred to a lot. And <clears throat> one thing that's important is that a resource block based on the width of each uh, resource element in there is 180 kilohertz wide. And so that number comes up a lot when you're talking about LTE. So it doesn't matter what the bandwidth is, there's always uh, resource blocks within that bandwidth that are made up of all these resource elements. All right, so if you kind of put that all together, you end up with this huge carrier, right? like I said before, I call it a, the bed of nails because it's got all these individual subcarriers bundled together in blocks called resource blocks. And you can see uh, the carrier bandwidth is variable. Most of the numbering in LTE starts at zero. so uh, you end up with, you know, a resource element and a resource block that's numbered zero. And so if you look at each one of the different bandwidths, whether it's 1.4, 3, 5, 10, 15, or 20, you have a different number of resource blocks that contain a different number of resource elements. But they're always proportional. Okay, now in some places I'll switch and we'll be looking at time on the axis versus frequency. So you kind of have to look at the slides to figure out, you know, which which direction I'm looking at. So, so far it's always been frequency along the horizontal. Um, so if you look at a resource block um, that has all these different resource elements, so every little box in this diagram is a resource element. So every one of them we refer to as a resource element. Um, inside that resource, uh, that set of resource elements, there are special signals put in there called reference signals or RS. So you'll see me use the term RS a lot as we go through this. Those reference signals are always present. So when you look at an LTE signal, in fact, when we saw that zoom in, you saw the spikes, well, those were reference signals. They're always there. Even when there's no data, those reference signals are there. And those are used by the mobile for timing and synchronization. They're, as I mentioned before, used to, to estimate 
channel um, conditions. Uh, so, I mean, imagine for a minute if you, you know, a land mobile radio system, the old analog systems, you know, if you had fading or something like that, you just would start to get, you know, broken up a garbled voice or, you know, then finally you would get um, just static if it faded too much. Well, because those reference signals are always sent out at a particular power level, the LTE mobiles or UEs that are out in the network, they can they can use that information to say, okay, I'm experiencing fading here, or I've got delay here, or I've got two signals coming in at different times because I can I can correlate those two based on the reference signals. Um, so really, it's an important feature of LTE those reference signals. Those reference signals are also used for power estimation. So when the mobile makes a measurement, it says, okay, well, I expect X amount of power from the reference signals. Um, here's what I got. Therefore, my path loss is X and it can, and the base station or the radio and the mobile can then communicate and turn up and down their power based on those, those power estimations. Uh, another key feature, and this is really critical, and I don't think in the industry it's exploited nearly enough by signal analyzers. Um, and so hopefully, and there's some things I put in this slide presentation that give you some ideas how to exploit this reference signal um, that's always present. Well, one key feature is that each reference or uh, each antenna port on the radio sends out different reference signals and they're, they're put in slightly different locations. And so in this particular diagram, you can see the different colored boxes. So the blue box is where the reference signal would be put coming from antenna port zero. And this assumes I have a four port radio. So, you know, those all correspond here in time and in, in frequency, whoops. Uh, so the, the, reference signals can be located by a signal analyzer and or a mobile and it so it knows which port these things are coming from now one thing i'll mention now we'll talk more about it later is that those reference signals will move around slightly based on the pci of the sector so uh, actually based on the primary and the secondary sync which ends up uh, creating the pci number and that's important because in some cases, I've been out trying to troubleshoot radios that have, for example, MIMO issues or handover issues. Everything looks really good. Um, the problem is, it turns out maybe it's because of the PCIs. The PCI actually determines where in that time uh, or that frequency rather that the, the uh, reference signals end up. And if the PCIs are incorrect, it screws things up. At any rate, uh, just in general, those reference signals make analyzing each port on that radio possible. Okay, another important feature of LTE or another important uh, channel are these primary and secondary sync uh, channels. And they're used by the phone when it, you know, when it starts up and then, you know, down the road as well to achieve frame sync, to get channel information, to identify which PCI they're looking at. And those, those channels, the, the primary sync and the secondary sync are put in a particular place inside the LTE frame. And if you look at this, this is the center of a carrier. That's the little center frequency we zoomed in on. And you can see why it looked different, and that's because it is different. There are these primary and secondary sync channels embedded into uh, subframe zero and subframe five. And if you look at a resource block, you know, just the size of the resource block, which I've outlined here, um, those resource blocks would include that, you know, that transmission for the uh, primary and secondary sync and then the repeat primary and secondary sync. So those are important channels as well. If you look at those 
in time, and you can see this, this is basically a time view. So I'm looking at zero span on an analyzer. So I'm seeing um, amplitude versus time here. And you'll notice right here and right here, the power here is, is different. In other words, instead of just all these reference signal spikes, and over here at the right is a zoom in, you see that primary and secondary sync location right here in frame zero and right here in frame five, or subframe five and subframe zero. Okay, so back to that frequency view. So if we assume that this is a 10 megahertz carrier, then we've got 50 of these resource blocks. And you can see here that there's essentially six resource blocks across that subframe zero and subframe five that make up that. And so what you see here, uh, two things. First of all, you see the reference signals going across there. The other thing you see here is this whole area right here is above everything else, and that's because this is a very lightly loaded carrier, and there's really no data in it except for this primary and secondary sync, and you can clearly distinguish that in this in this view. Um, one of the things you know we saw earlier, right, that the bandwidth of an LTE carrier, the smallest one, is 1.4 megahertz. And that's really because um, when you get down to it, um, that channel, actually 1.4 channel, is a narrower bandwidth, which is really six resource blocks. So the, the minimum number of resource blocks that you can transmit in LTE is six. And that's why this is the smallest bandwidth, is because that's what houses this critical primary and secondary sync. Okay, so what are some of the implications of this? Well, with regard to reference signals, because they're always present, um, you know, carrier power can fluctuate, but the reference signals don't within that carrier. They're supposedly constant all the time, or should be. So they give us a good idea of what the signal, you know, good reference really for the signal power and the overall signal quality. Um, the fact that the reference signals are unique Obviously, as I mentioned, you can then troubleshoot individual antenna ports for, you know, for power and signal quality and so forth. The PSS and, and SSS, or the primary and secondary sync, are also critical. And, you know, we can look at those in terms of power and, you know, EVM. Those, many of these, these channels can be set, you know, manually. Uh, and sometimes there's mistakes made in the setting of carriers and sometimes you know, it's useful to be able to see those different settings. And then finally, 180 kilohertz resource blocks, because that's really the channel communication medium. It's the measurement bandwidth that's really most used for determining things like receiver noise level. So you'll see it over and over again. And some systems might report different bandwidths, power levels for different bandwidths. Um, but really what it comes down to is that the primary communication channel is 180 kilohertz. So, so that's really helpful as a standard for understanding things like receiver noise floor. Okay, so let's jump into some of the testing. So general purpose tests, uh, power. Um, I just mentioned that it's always bandwidth specific. Even if you're talking about uh, power within some of these, uh, you know, channels that are spread out, um, there's always a certain bandwidth associated with those, especially when you talk about just transmit power or receive noise power in a general purpose kind of power measurement. So the, the power level does, does relate to the bandwidth that's used in the measurement. And again, OSS systems, when you look into them, they sometimes report power in different ways. And so it's hard when you look at those to understand, well, is that good or is that bad? Well, it depends on the bandwidth. So if you were looking at a receiver noise level issue, maybe, again, based on bandwidth, there's different ways reported. And I've seen, and maybe some of you have seen other ways of it being reported or other bandwidths. Most often it's reported in a single resource block in terms of quality of the noise floor or, you know, the level of the noise. <clears throat> 
So for a 180 kilohertz, one resource block, that theoretical noise level is about minus 121 dBm. The actual um, noise floor by the time you know the receiver is added into that is about neg 118, and it goes up and down with frequency, but that's roughly where a ideal noise floor would sit. Some OSS systems you know, don't get that granular. They might give it in, I've seen it in terms of four resource blocks. So in that case, well, if that's the report, then good is a different number because it's a wider bandwidth. And I've seen it in five. Um, and then sometimes the channel bandwidth is reported, you know, so depending on the bandwidth, you know, these are the numbers that really determine the ideal noise floor. Okay, well, one you know one thing you can do without even demodulating, right? Potentially, is just measure the the actual output. You could either connect and measure the output, but more and more connecting is nearly impossible. Unlike you know, just say a decade ago, you know, we can't reach any of these things because they're all up on towers and um, just very difficult to do that. But um, you could do it over the air as well, just to get a feel for it. You know, I, I say here in my last bullet, it provides a ballpark. Um, you don't want to place too much credence in it, but it can give you a rough idea of, okay, is this radio really putting out what I think it should put out? And so I've got a, a channel power measurement here on a carrier, and you can you can tell from this screen here that my span is about seven megahertz. So this is a five megahertz carrier. And I've turned on some averaging. It's usually helpful because, you know, the signal jumps around a lot. And so this radio is putting out about minus 38 dBm. So is that good or bad? Well, the only way really to know that for sure is just do a quick path loss estimate based on your equipment and the you know the over the air path loss and that's fairly easy to do this is just a quick example of one so if i measured 40 dbm you know at the analyzer at 0.1 then i'm using an antenna that has a certain amount of gain probably and you do want to use a directional antenna so you isolate a particular sector um, so if my antenna has 14 dB of gain, that means that it's lower in power on the on the other side of that antenna. And so I can subtract out 14 dB and get to my 0.2 here. And then I can include path loss. And you know, I throw a formula in here for path loss if you want to make this estimation at some point. Um, and so the path loss adds because as it goes from the end of that antenna, uh, it's going to get stronger and stronger as it approaches the antenna. So at 250 meters, I think this was a 1900 megahertz example. I didn't put it in here, but at 1900 megahertz, that path loss is about 86 dBm. So that gets me to 0.3, which is about 32 dBm. And then finally, the, the base station antennas have gain. So it gets bumped up again because of that gain. And I've included about 17 dB uh, of gain for that antenna. And so bottom line is my base station is putting out roughly 49 dBm. So just a quick and dirty calculation to say, yeah, it looks about right. Now, um, uh, I'll mention before I go on here, if you do have signal analysis, capabilities, oftentimes they will measure or you'll want to measure the reference um, signal power because it's always constant, always there, and you don't have to do any calculations other than you could do some path loss to figure out what it is, but um, this is only if you really don't have uh, signal analysis capability. Okay, another kind of common power measurement, which is uh, done sometimes to see if the radio is operating within the band it wants. This really varies by country. Some countries use this a lot. Some countries, they don't care unless somebody complains. Um, but there's also, in, in many of these signal analyzer products, there are you know, channel spectrum kinds of uh, measurements. In this case, it's really an occupied 
spectrum measurement. And so it's saying here that in this, this measurement, it's saying that 99% of the power is in this particular bandwidth. Well, that's certainly within the 10 megahertz channel. But if you look way back at the beginning on the chart, it turns out that's wider than the actual carrier. Well, why is that? Well, it turns out if you look over here on the right, there's this funny looking hump right here. And on this, this measurement, that could be one of two things. It could actually be an out of band um, LTE, you know, LTE IOT uh, signal. So that, you know, that some carriers put an IOT signal, which is LTE for, you know, very low data rate devices. Um, next to the carrier, just out of band. In this case, I think this is a GSM carrier that has been crowded in right next to uh, this LTE carrier because they still need to keep a GSM channel up because they can't get rid of all their GSM phones yet. But you can usually set that and measure it according to how you want, want to do it, either by um, you know, a level, so you could use signal level to say that it is, you know, it's in channel or not, or you could use a percent of power, you know, calculation as well. Okay, so let's talk about what's actually being measured and how it's measured. And before we do that, we'll talk a little, a little bit more detail about the actual measurements and what they are telling us. So there's these other terms in LTE. One of them is RSRP. So that is essentially the power that's in the reference signals. And so again, each antenna sends out its own reference signals. And so it's the power in those particular reference signals. It's not data, it's just the reference signal. That's always reported in terms of average power. So it's not accumulation across that whole uh, spectrum, it's just the average across that spectrum. So if you have one that's 0.1 and one that's, you know, 1.2, the average would be, or if you have one that's 0.1 and one that's 0.12, the average would be 0.11, right? Um, it turns out there's far more than that across the whole bandwidth, but that gives you the idea. It's an average. It's not the total sum of power across all those reference signals. There's also a term called RSSI, and I don't care much for that term. It stands for Received Signal Strength Indicator. Um, the reason I don't like it is because it doesn't carry a bandwidth connotation with it. So you don't really know, is it good or is it bad, unless you know the bandwidth. In LTE, you kind of do because your carrier is a certain bandwidth, and so that is the bandwidth that RSSI is actually measuring. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, but RSSI is measured differently. It's the total power from all the symbols that are present in that particular um, reference signal time slot or symbol. So remember we said that one resource block could send out seven symbols. So it's one of those symbols where the reference signals appear, that's where RSSI is measured. So it includes the power in the reference signals and any noise or other uh, you know, transmissions from other base stations that might be appearing. Um, we'll look at some examples here in just a second, you know, give you a rough idea of how it's calculated. But again, it's only measured in symbols where the reference signals are present and it's the it's the total power not the average reference signal is out or rsrp is average okay and then there's this term rsrq well rsrq is a signal quality indicator it's some in some ways very similar to signal to noise and it's basically the number of resource blocks times the reference signal power so there's there's the reference signals divided by the RSSI. Now remember the RSSI includes reference signals as well as noise. So it's really kind of a signal to noise ratio that is scaled 
based on the number of resource blocks that are in the carrier. Okay, so a couple of examples. Here's an example. If you have a carrier that's completely unloaded, single carrier, no noise, best possible case, only reference signals exist, um, you can go through the calculation and say, okay, well, the RSSI is going to be essentially equal to the number of reference signals. So if I assume I've got a 5 megahertz carrier, every resource block in that 5 meg carrier has two of these. And so there's 25 resource blocks in a 5 meg carrier. So that means there's 50 of these reference signals that are transmitted. So if I assume that that value is 0.1, then what I would expect is that my best case RSRQ, you know, if you convert it to dB, uh, which would be 10 times the log of that value, is minus 3 dB. So that's the absolute best case for the um, RSRQ. If I take another example and I say, okay, well, I'm transmitting data, then now I've got, not only am I measuring the reference signals, but I'm measuring all those reference elements that also have data. And that turns out to be about 300 of those reference elements. I get minus 10.8 dB. So that really on a loaded carrier is about as good as it's going to get. From there, it goes down. So you'll make measurements on a really good carrier somewhere between minus three typically to minus 10. And as soon as you get out away from the sector, or if you're not using a directional antenna, it'll degrade from there. And in this next example, I'm going into too much detail, but I've said, okay, well, let's assume that there's noise in this reference signal, in all these reference signals. And it double the power that's in them. Well, that creates an RSRQ that's say minus 13. And now we start to get into the area where it's not really ideal. It's starting to degrade from, you know, at ideal at 10.8 on a loaded carrier down to 13.4 as I approach the edge of a sector. And it turns out, I think that the, the minimum gets down to about 19 or 20 minus 19 or 20 dB. So from about 10, roughly, down to about minus 20, um, that's sort of the range you would expect when you measure RSRQ. And then finally, you'll sometimes see SINAR. Well, most times you'll see SINAR in instruments or signal analyzers. And it's really a signal to, uh, interference plus noise ratio. Now it's not defined by 3GBP, 3GPP, so the standard doesn't include signal to noise. So I found over the years that, you know, sometimes this measurement varies a little bit depending on the device. Not, not everybody seems to do it the same way because it's really not defined how you're supposed to do it. So keep that in mind if you're using it as a reference. You may be, be seeing some variation based on devices. Um, but most phones, whoops, most phones and uh, instruments will make a SINAR measurement. And this chart really gives you a rough idea of, you know, what's what's perfect all the way down to what's not not so good. All right. And one last thing here before we start talking about the actual measurements that you want to understand is how modulation occurs in most of the channels in LTE, and that is through what's called quadrature amplitude modulation, or QAM. It's really a circular reference. Um, you can think of it as, you know, I can, you know, I can move about this, you know, this quadrature in time so as i move around in time i may hit different points depending on you know how fast i moved so on and so forth 
And these would represent the actual values potentially, and I'm not sure if they're right for LT or not. But um, so this would be two, you know, a symbol would be two bits in this case in, in QAM. And as the signal is rotated or as the, you know, the, the signal is measured, it's displayed as an amplitude and as an angle as opposed to think of it like this. So your grandfather's old Buick had a speedometer that moved from left to right straight across the dashboard, right? Um, and when he floored it, it moved faster and probably started to approach the gas gauge going the other way. But um, that's more of a linear approach. Whereas, you know, most of the time now we have speedometers that operate in a circle. So it's kind of the same concept. Um, so there are certain target values, target angles, and target amplitudes for an EVM measurement. So if you were to look at one build up slowly, you'd see that you get actual points that appear around the targets or close to the target. And EVM, or error vector magnitude, is a measurement of how close the actual data, the measured location, got to the target. So an ideal vector would hit the target directly. The actual is somewhat off, and so there's an error vector. And so EVM is really the average across multiples of those uh, data points. So depending on how much time was included, uh, you may, may make many thousands of measurements and average those. EVM is expressed in a percentage, and the lower the percentage is better. Zero would be perfect. 100% would be terrible. Okay, so what are the actual tests? Well, let's talk about the most common tests. Most signal analyzers have a tremendous number of tests. And so we can't really talk about all of them. So I'll try and cover some of the ones that I see used the most or ones I think should be used more potentially. Uh, one of those is coverage mapping. Usually it's, it's sort of a strongest PCI measurement where you can go through a building, for example, either indoor or you could do it outdoor. And it's really good at finding coverage holes, uh, estimating coverage for say DAS or estimating how much power I need to design my DAS to produce in certain areas of the building. Um, and, you know, there's solutions that do indoor as well as outdoor. Uh, for instance, you know, we, we work with a product that allows you to um, move around inside a building and, and it knows pretty much where you're at when you move, whether it's up, down, forward, backwards. Um, so that's a very common measurement that you can make with a signal analyzer. Um, another one is a scanning measurement or multi-PCI measurement. And uh, I say scanning because in signal analyzers, they're really not a true scanner. So there's some advantages to both. Um, the signal analyzer, of course, has usually far more functionality with regard to general RF stuff. Um, because it's not really necessarily purpose built just for scanning. But at any rate, it allows you to locate PCIs, including ones that maybe aren't in a neighbor list. So you're missing neighbor, for example, where the phone doesn't even know about it. Um, it does allow you to provide basic coverage and quality information. And multi PCI measurements are typically done in, in um, signal analyzers a diff in a different way than they're done uh, for some channel kinds of measurements. In other words, typically when you're doing this kind of a measurement, you want it to be fast. So there's oftentimes some shortcuts made to try and speed it up so that you can make these measurements as you drive down a highway or move through a building or whatever. Um, so they're generally faster. One thing I want to mention about this is you can you can very easily with this kind of a measurement figure out well what in the world is going on in certain situations that are very difficult to troubleshoot so for example the pci in lte determines where the reference signals are 
And reference signals, if the PCIs aren't right, can conflict with each other. So phones, if they are in sectors where there's this conflict, they have trouble. Um, and it's even more important in TDD systems, for those of you who deal with LTE that's on a single channel, there's no separate uplink and downlink, PCI planning is even more important because of the conflicts that can occur. Um, and the reason for that is because the reference signals are remapped and even the overhead, like the broadcast channel, is remapped based on the PCI. So if you if you wanted to look at it from an RF perspective, like the bottom by the bottom of this display, um, you could do that. And I apologize, my headset for some reason is giving me a battery low indicator, so I may have to switch headsets here shortly. So we might have to take a little bit of a break to do that. But anyway, um, you can also look at the reference signals from a you know, from a spectrum analyzer point of view, and you can determine where those are at and actually move from sector to sector, for example, and determine, oh yeah, the PCIs seem off here. Usually they're numbered in sequence. Maybe they're not, and for some reason you're having trouble. Well, it could be a, a reference signal conflict between sectors. You can actually see where those are with a spectrum analyzer. So I would expect you know, say this particular reference signal might move over slightly in the, in the next sector over. That way the phone can distinguish between sectors easily. Okay, then there's also antenna port measurements that you can make because the reference signals represent different ports in different locations. You can actually, in most signal analyzers, um, you can actually define which antenna you wanna look at. And in this particular example, I'm seeing that reference signal one on on this antenna. So this would be this reference signal one. And reference signal zero are roughly the same power, which is good. Um, that allows you to very quickly identify, okay, are there are there some just common, you know, or some very quick to diagnose issues going on here with this site. It's also convenient for DAS where you may have many antennas you know, in a location for a single sector. Okay. Now I will mention that requires that you use, a you know, a directional antenna because you'll need to rotate it to try and get the best power from that particular port you're looking at. So you can't, you know, you can't just throw the antenna out there. You're going to get, um, you know, a combination. But if you rotate it and get it in phase with the antenna port, then you should be able to see power within a few dB of each other between ports. Okay, here's here's an example I bring up because um, you know I, this is a site where reference signal zero, you know, on one polarization is tied to reference signal three and it probably doesn't cause an issue but you can you can kind of see well maybe it should have been you know zero should be tied to that same phase as two oftentimes zero and one should be different but you know you can you can troubleshoot actual you know actual cabling to the antennas which is very useful so you can't see which port is which, even with binoculars, you know, do this to figure out if you need to call a contractor to climb the tower. Another um, thing that you can look at, and here, this is an example of a site that I found uh, here a few weeks ago where the power levels are significantly different. I think this base station's having some trouble. The power level, the best I could get on ports two and three were, you know, were 10 dB lower. So the ports appeared to be the right polarities, but the power was less. So that may or may not be an issue, but it's easy to detect those differences by using a directional antenna and just pointing at the side. Another thing you can do is compare EVM. So in this example, this site 
has some kind of an issue going on uh, where the best value I could get out of the first port uh, was about 26% EVM. And you can see it you know, graphically in these instruments as well. And that's you know, in contrast to the best value from the second port or port one which is consistently about 10% better than the other ports. So there's something going on with this radio. And I doubt they care very much because this sector happened to be pointed at, you know, fields and cows for the most part. So they probably even haven't, haven't even bothered to troubleshoot it because, you know, the KPIs don't matter on this one. But again, you rotate the antenna and then you can isolate and set a particular port and look at just at that port. The other thing I'll mention is, you know, you can go to sites and make measurements on known good radios to get a feel for what these EVM values should be based on how far away you are. I think on this site, I was probably 250 meters away. So that's a pretty good EVM number uh, for 250 meters, 16% roughly, probably hard for you to see that. Whereas 25% starting to creep up with a, with a high gain directional antenna. Again, you got to isolate that second with a directional antenna. Okay, carrier aggregation is another measurement that can be made. Um, and this is really handy if you're trying to just get a quick look at a bunch of your carriers. You can, I think in our instruments, you can define up to eight different channels. And it, the instrument will round robin through them and give you some of the key statistics for each channel. And so you very quickly get an idea, okay, this whole sector seems to be pretty good. It's also handy if you're trying to do benchmarking, say us versus the other guys. Uh, do we have good coverage here versus them? You can look at you know, three, or four, you know, three or four of your carriers versus three or four of theirs and get a good feel for it quickly. And then one last measurement I think is kind of undermade in many cases is time alignment error. So time alignment error compares the timing of each port. So if you look at this graphic over here on the right, you can see that um, each one of these antenna ports, each antenna pair is compared to the other, zero to one, zero to two, and so forth. And in a healthy site, and this this one I think maybe I was 100 meters away from um, with a directional antenna. In a healthy site, typically you're gonna you're gonna need to have less than 65 nanoseconds for MIMO and you know transmit diversity to work properly. And this frankly would be the first thing I would check if somebody said I've got MIMO issues at this site, I would check timing first thing. And it's also useful in DAS. You know, if you have DAS systems that are struggling, um, you know, antenna connections uh, in DAS systems are like spaghetti. There's just so many antennas, and oftentimes very difficult to troubleshoot those. So, if you have lots of antenna connections in the same sector, they can take very different routes, and so timing can be an issue as well in DAS. So. Excuse me, there's lots more measurements that we could talk about. There's all kinds of different channels. <coughs> Excuse me, we're out of time for now, but um, so I wanted to stop there and I think we've got a few minutes maybe we can use for questions if my headset holds out. So before that, I want to thank you for attending and Tina, if you could jump in and see mm. if we have any questions. Yeah, thank you, Roy. Um, I do have a couple. Um, majority of them were wanting the slides, um, and again, those that have registered will get a post webinar email, and they will be sent to you directly. So, uh, one of the questions is, what feature, if any, is available on the spectrum analyzer that can depict time delay measured in the field off air on the LTE protocol? Yeah, well, when you have a GPS, um, and I'll have to look at our latest analyzer, what it has in terms of delay, but we do have GPS, and so I think uh, 
that we probably have some place in some of these measurements a delay. So I'll make sure I get your email address and look in there to um, to respond to you. But it, I think it's something we could potentially add fairly easily if we don't have it in one of the screens. There's so many screens I don't remember. But I'll, so I'll follow up with you. Um, the other one is a two-part question. Um, why did you subtract the gain? Usually it's added. Also, what's the impact of RS boost? Uh, okay, well, first question, why did I subtract the gain? Well, the antenna, I'm working back from the instrument. So at the instrument, the gain is higher than it is just outside the antenna because the antenna has gain. As it goes from through the antenna to the instrument, the gain goes up. But if you go the other way, it goes down. So that's the answer to the first one. So boost, what that I think refers to typically from my understanding is that you can take the reference signals and boost their power and you know above what you'd normally transmit data with. And that allows the phone uh, a little more latitude as far as detecting you know its its channel conditions as you know in areas of poor coverage or you know inter handoff sections um, so having those reference signals is critical and boosting those reference signals can provide some additional um, additional benefit when signal coverage isn't isn't as good as it could be the um, the bottom line is though it steals power away from the data so it does reduce somewhat the uh, data throughput that you probably could expect so i hope that helps um, there may be a lot more other tricky things about kicking up the boost of the reference signals um, that i'm not aware of but uh, Certainly, if you want to follow up with me, I'm happy to dig into that and talk to some performance engineers that I know that might be helpful in giving you a better answer. <clears throat> Thank you, Roy. That was all the questions that have come in. Uh, if there's any other questions, uh, go ahead and type them in. We'll give you one minute. Otherwise, um, you can contact Roy and he will get back to you. Okay. Uh, All right, well. Don't have any more questions, Roy. All right, well, hey, I wanna thank everybody for attending, really appreciate it, and uh, have a great Thanksgiving holiday. Thank you, Dina. Great, thank you, everyone. This concludes our webinar. Goodbye.